right, it looks like folks are still trickling in, but um, I will get started with our brief announcements at the beginning. So welcome to the webinar. This is the future looking emissions factor uh, applications webinar. And uh, this is being put on by the ABIPSA Education Committee. I'm Carrie Brown, I'm a member of the committee, and I'm also the current president of ABIPSA USA. A few quick announcements. Um, this will be recorded and we'll share a link to the presentation as well as the PDF afterwards. So you can have those for yourselves. Um, we're gonna take questions and answers at the end. So use the Q&A feature and I'll track those for you and, and hopefully get them all answered. And I wanna take a moment to welcome our ABIPSA USA members. Uh, for those of you in the audience who are already members, thank you. If you are not a member, please consider joining. There's some information on the screen about how to do that. We'd love to have you. I'm also doing double duty today because my company Resource Refocus is sponsoring this webinar. We are a small research and consulting firm uh, that specializes in zero net energy and zero carbon buildings. We're based in California, New York, and um, we're really passionate about building decarbonization. So we were excited to be able to uh, sponsor this webinar. And then uh, lastly, I'm gonna introduce you to our speakers. I'm really excited to have this group. It's a truly impressive group uh, with a wealth of knowledge and experience. Uh, I'll give just really quick introductions because we would be here the whole time if I told you all of the things that they have done. Uh, our first speaker is gonna be Randall Higa. He's an internal consulting engineer involved with building electrification and codes and standards at Southern California Edison. He'll be followed by Dr. Drew Crawley, who's Bentley Fellow and Director of Building Performance Research. He's focusing on zero energy buildings, decarbonization, digital twins, and resilience. And then finally, Charles Ely is an architect, mechanical engineer, and author with 40 years of experience in energy efficient and sustainable design. And with that, I will hand it over to Randall. Uh, let me get your slides pulled up. Hello, everybody. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carrie. Um, welcome, everybody. So this is a follow-on from the last month's meeting um, about uh, that uh, picks up from where the uh, emission factors or how the emission factors are developed and forecasted. So in this presentation, um, I'll be talking about how those emission factors are uh, used in the uh, California Title 24 Part 6, which are the Building Energy Efficiency Standards. Next slide, please. So today I'm gonna cover, uh, go back one. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna start off with a little bit of background on Title 24 Part 6. I think many of you know about it, but also I'll make that quick. I'm going to talk about the previous metrics that were used for compliance and the performance approach in Title 24, and then start talking about the new metrics, the purpose of them, and how we uh, selected them for application into Title 24. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background. Uh, Title 24, Part 6 was promulgated by the Warren Alquist Act that was signed into law in 1974 by then Governor Ronald Reagan. Um, this created the California Energy Commission as well as the Appliance and Building Standards uh, in California. And built into um, Title 24 and the Appliance Standards is this issue of continuous maintenance. So every three, three to four years, the Title 24 code is updated. And I think that's a very important aspect of, of this regulation. And to be adopted into standard, they, um, the standard must be cost-effective, feasible to, uh, to deploy, and requires products that are, on, that are in and available in the marketplace. Next slide, please. 
So a little bit of background on energy metrics. Um, uh, there used to be two basic uh, um, sort of ways to look at uh, the energy metrics. Uh, one is source energy, that is from, from the supply of uh, the fossil fuel to the power plant, through the transmission distribution lines and, to, and then to the buildings. And considering all of those, all of the losses and efficiencies along the way, and side energy is just measuring the energy which um, goes into the building through the energy meter. Next slide, please. So source energy, as I mentioned, accounts for the generation transmission distribution losses. And it was deemed um, to be 33% uh, as delivered to the building because of the generation losses and transmission distribution losses. And natural gas had the same efficiency whether it was delivered to the building or the power plants, so it was 100%. And this is used by Title 24 from the beginning of Title 24 in the 70s through the 2001 Title 24 version, which meant that it was used all the way up through 2000 five when a new metric kicked in at that point. Um, and because it made electricity less efficient, it was favored by the gas industry. Whereas site energy, because it's measuring the energy going into the building by the utility meters, they were considered both 100% uh, energy. And of course, in this case, the electric industry favored that because the efficiency was higher. Next slide. So in 2005, a new metric was uh, deployed. It was in, in the works for a number of years prior to that called time-dependent valuation. The two key aspects of time-dependent valuation is that it is a cost metric and it is an hourly metric. And those are two somewhat separate things, but combined together, um, it created a, a new metric. And it also was forecast for 30 years into the future, non-residential 30 years, I'm sorry, 15 years, 30 years for residential buildings. And you can see all the things it incorporates, the gen marginal generation, transmission, fuel capacity, et cetera, and some CO2 emissions. However, the value of TDV was primarily driven by the retail cost of the fuel. So in this case, when the cost of natural gas was lower than um, electricity, it tended to favor natural gas and, di and didn't track carbon emissions as well as it could have, even though carbon emissions are included in the TDV calculations that didn't have a, a predominant effect. Next slide, please. So it was recognized that for decarbonization, there, needs to, there needed to be a new metric, something that more closely followed carbon uh, GHG emissions. Um, and th so these were the other goals that were identified by the CEC, California Energy Commission, to, to, to develop those new uh, um, uh, metrics. So they wanted to maintain energy efficiency for sure, um, resiliency, and then with the advent of DERs, more self-utilization of on-site PV generation to include demand response um, and avoid preemption. So, um, and there was an issue in the 2019 code not to increase the stringency of residential standards for one code cycle in exchange for uh, requiring PV in buildings. So that second to the last one was specific to 29, the 19 code. Um, next, next slide, please. 
Again, uh, a more detailed list of criteria for the new metrics. I don't wanna go through all of these, but just wanna highlight again, efficiency, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, grid harmonization and cost effectiveness. All of those were the key issues that were, um, that were part of the selection of the appropriate metric. Next slide, please. So um, E3, uh, and again, uh, in, in last month's meeting, uh, uh, Michael Sontag did a presentation of what, what they did to develop a new metric. And they ended up running um, 19 different scenarios for the CEC. And um, all of these are based on an hourly source energy uh, metric and different flavors of hourly source metric. Although the uh, uh, number one and two there are just strictly uh, TDV, the rest were some version of source, source energy. And to cut to the chase, these are the two that were selected. The first one is hourly source energy metric which is part of compliance. And then the emission metrics is for reporting purposes, okay? And they're slightly different. And you can see on the right-hand side, there's different metric categories of what they were trying to achieve, whether it's cost effectiveness, energy, GHG reduction, or a combination thereof. And the combination um, metric would have been ideal because then you would only need one metric that deals with all of the all of the criterion that the um, CEC wanted. So there's a few there that are hourly source energy um, and with some sort of capacity constraint. Now you get into that if somebody has a question about that, but what happened was it didn't quite work out. Um, in other words, it would cause a batteries to overpower efficiency, and you didn't you didn't want that kind of thing to happen. And and again, and the last thing I'll emphasize on this chart is that it does focus on long run marginal emissions. Okay, so the two chosen um, metrics there do rely on that, as as explained by again, last month's presentation by both Peter and, and, and Michael. Next slide, please. So what happened? As I said, those combined metrics didn't work. Um, and there were not one of those metrics on the previous slide really met all of the criteria. So the CEC decided to use two metrics in a two-step approach. So. They have two EDRs or design energy design ratings. So number one is hourly source energy, and it reflects pretty well the carbon emissions. And keep in mind the CEC can't use a carbon emissions metric um, for a number of reasons. And so they could only use either a energy or cost metric. So EDR1 is an, is an energy metric. EDR2 is, a, is time dependent valuation again, which is the cost metric. It's been updated uh, for the 2022 code. And the, by the way, these will all go into place in 2020, for the 2022 code. So EDR2 protects the efficiency and also incentivizes grid harmonization demand flexibility. Um, both by not sacrificing one for the other, that is efficiency versus grid harmonization and demand flexibility. And there are no trade-offs allowed between EDR1 and EDR2. Next slide, please. Um, again, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, um, but this, this pretty much is a, goes into a little bit more detail of what these different metrics are good at doing and what they're not good at doing. 
Um, so again, it was based on this analysis, it was decided to go with the two-step approach. Next slide, please. This is uh, uh, some sample parametric, one parametric run that was done to sort, or well, a couple parametric runs that were shown to see what the impacts are, this two-step EDR, and this is for residential. And again, I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but it's looking at, you know, where it says mixed, it means mixed fuel, HPW, this uh, heat pump water heater, and the 96 A AFU, that's a condensing uh, gas furnace. So some of the mixed fuel um, uh, uh, runs still didn't pass, even with very high efficiency gas um, uh, uh, appliances. Not to say that you can't still comply with gas, it just makes it um, uh, a, a little bit harder. Um, next slide, please. You know, end with um, a summary here. So, um, you know, it was determined that the past metrics, uh, source energy, TDV, were not quite sufficient for meeting today's new criteria for low GHG buildings with, that are grid harmonized. And again, uh, emphasizing that we, that it, uh, the, the metrics are based on long run marginal, hourly uh, uh, emissions, and um, uh, that it will favor uh, decarbonization more and more as, especially as the grid gets more decarbonized. Um, the use of a carbon proxy um, by itself didn't quite make it, as I mentioned. And so we had to go to a two-step compliance process. And again, as I mentioned, this is for the 2022 version of Title 24, which will go in, which becomes effective on January 1st, 2023. So thank you. Great, thank you, Randall. That is a uh, quite a task you undertook with your with your team. Our next speaker is going to be Drew Crawley. Drew, I'll hand the screen share over to you. Okay, hang on just a sec. And as you're doing that, I'll remind folks, if you have any questions, just go ahead and put them in the Q&A feature and I will uh, get them all at the end. Okay, we all set? Yep, we're good, we're seeing your slide. Okay, great. Now, uh, thank you to Pipsa USA for inviting me. This is uh, something that um, ASHRAE has become uh, quite a bit more interested in, particularly as some of our standards are beginning to uh, go there. Uh, this is actually a summary of some work that I was doing for the Standards Committee because there have been some concern that emissions and other uh, metrics were being uh, treated a little differently. So, um, but so I'm going to go through a number of standards which have both energy and emissions, but we're going to focus on, on just a, a couple of them. So, <clears throat> Why do we care about uh, carbon emissions? I mean, if we look at buildings, uh, buildings are about 35% of the energy uh, worldwide. Uh, it, you know, the, the construction industry as well as our non-residential commercial. But if we look at uh, carbon, uh, it's even higher. And part of the reason of that is there's uh, the indirect effect, some of the things that Randall was talking about in the electricity that buildings are actually responsible for a lot more of the electricity use than many of the other sectors. So it's important that we consider that when we're working on that. And, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, ASHRAE standards for many years have been uh, focusing on other aspects of that, particularly energy efficiency and, and working on that. <coughs> so, uh, 
some of the standards, and I'll go through all of them, there are quite a bit quite a few. There's the 90 series, uh, 90.1, which is uh, pre predominantly all buildings except low-rise residential, then 90.2, the low-rise residential, 90.4, which is data centers, you know, the specialized requirements there, um, standard 100, which deals with existing buildings, 105, which is a standard for um, presenting and determining, com expressing, comparing building energy performance and greenhouse gas emissions. And that, that last piece is new. We'll talk a little bit about that. That standard is actually very close to being published. It's in press at this point, that update for 2021. Uh, other standards related, uh, standard 189, which is very similar to 90.1, but is for green buildings. So it goes beyond the energy portion of that. There's also 189.3, which deals with healthcare facilities. It builds on 189.1, but it also has uh, specialized information around healthcare. There are two other standards under development. Uh, there's a passive building design standard. Think of super insulated uh, buildings. This is something that's come out of Europe, but uh, they're looking to uh, have it as a as standard. It'll be different in a sense from the other standards, because it's going to focus more on building envelope and other activities. And then standard 228, which has been out for public review once, and they're dealing with the comments at this point. Um, it's evaluating zero net energy and zero net carbon. So really getting into some of the meat of that right now. So if we look at the, the three energy standards, the 90.1, 90.2, 90.3, we can look at some of the, uh, the aspects of them. Uh, the first version of the standard uh, dates back uh, 45 plus years uh, to the um, first oil embargo and, and uh, oil shortage in uh, the early 1970s. And there was a need for that. It's since grown quite a bit. Uh, it's been split into commercial, residential and the data centers now. But the focus of these is energy efficiency. Uh, within 90.1, you've got the energy cost budget where you're comparing energy sources based on cost, not on um, their actual thermal values. And then the performance rating method, which allows you to do a comparison of a proposed to baseline energy performance. In this case, though, there's no emissions, but the 90.1 committee is beginning to look at it as a jurisdictional option to replace uh, or to supplement the uh, cost method or the performance rating method. Uh, 90.2, the residential standard has an energy rating index based on building simulation, but no re emissions requirements. But again, like 90.1, that committee is beginning to think about carbon and think about how they could do it at a residential scale. Um, 90.4 starts off with 90.1, but it concentrates on data center efficiency. And again, it has no emissions requirements. Uh, standard 100, this sets targets, actual uh, kilo BTU per square foot per year targets for existing buildings uh, to improve their efficiency and, and uh, for a comparison and a baseline. They have fuel type conversions in there, but the for focus again is source energy uh, and no emissions factors. Standard uh, 105, uh, the last published version is, is uh, uh, 2014. Again, it's a method for presenting information about building performance or energy performance. It essentially is a set of blank tables. Uh, there are blank tables for greenhouse gases, US national uh, average data like uh, standard 189.1, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, it's under revision. It's been through two public review drafts, uh, but the, the 2021 version is in press. They're just preparing the, the final version of that. There are example um, annual um, retrospective, as in looking past from the grid uh, data for uh, various regions. In the past, they just had single value for uh, national. That unfortunately doesn't help those outside the US. And that's kind of one of the ongoing challenges uh, that we have is that there's not as, as uh, consistent data as we get through eGrid or other sources. 
If we go on to 189.1, uh, this has had carbon equivalent emissions factors since the 2009 version. Now these are retrospective. They are uh, based on uh, whatever the latest version of eGrid, which is a previous year or three. Um, and eGrid is uh, from the US EPA and they have various uh, grid delivered um, <clears throat> electricity factors and other, other fuel types. And you can see some of the factors there. These were updated a bit in the uh, 2017 version and there's more work going on. For the 2020 version uh, just published last year, these emission factors were uh, even further expanded. Uh, I mentioned the US EPA's eGrid. This is a map of the regions, but also you see the values by region and being able to see what's going on there. Uh, so that there's more tied to the locale and, and how electricity is uh, supported within that particular area. Um, and I already kind of mentioned this with 105 and, and also with uh, 189.1. Uh, we've been using retrospective factors, uh, you know, factors from 2019 or earlier. So it's a snapshot of the grid at that point, and it's an average single value. And as you saw in Randall's presentation, the the carbon equivalent uh, that's going on in the uh, in the grid varies by time of day, by year, by time of year. So. Currently looking, uh, working on a forward looking more of, you know, a future looking about uh, 20 year um, uh, global warming potential uh, horizon, looking at that uh, marginal as well. These are average values, not what the, what the individual uh, part is. And also looking at doing a, a diurnal pattern, a single day per month that would represent what the, the carbon factors are. And at this point, I'm just going to say Charles has got a great presentation uh, coming up on this, and he'll go into a lot more detail on that because he's been working on this for, for quite a while. Uh, 189.3, uh, again, it's the healthcare facilities, but it's based off mostly uh, the requirements are 189.1, but they have some extensions uh, specific to healthcare facilities. Um, the, the one thing is they uh, point to the carbon emissions in 189.1, but they also have some additional emissions for uh, large combustion uh, equipment um, in, in trying to take that into account. So it's more of a, 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 a use situation. Um, standard uh, 227, the passive, it's exceptionally low energy buildings, and that's actually in the, the purpose. Uh, it's under development. Uh, they've been meeting for a couple of years now, uh, not had a public review, but the chair uh, does tell me that they're not planning to do uh, admissions at all, partly because it is focused on the efficiency level, not, not on the, the impact of the energy used. 228 is really the other standard that um, um, came out. There was a first public review this past April and see the document there. Uh, it is a way of determining whether a building is achieving net zero energy or net zero carbon in operation. And really that it is the focus of that. Uh, for this, there was a hundred year uh, global warming potential time horizon used. Um, uh, currently that uh, that's under discussion to probably change and I think they will maybe encourage to, to take a, a somewhat shorter look and maybe come into better alignment with 189.1 as well. There, it, um, the uh, public review came up with lots of comments and those are being uh, reviewed and responses prepared that's been ongoing since, since April. Um, at this point, they are looking to uh, put out a, a second public review, which will just be the changes from this public review draft with the, again, that global warming potential uh, time horizon being changed. So in summary, we've got a number of energy standards, but they don't consider emissions at all. They do consider the, the uh, fuel conversions to for source energy, but 
they're also not consistent, which is, is an issue as well. Uh, I already mentioned uh, 90.1, 90.2 are considered operational emissions, but it's early. I don't even think they have draft documents at this point, but it, it's in their, their plans. Uh, we do have four standards, but um, that are, do have operational emissions, but they are uh, not consistent with each other. Uh, 189.3 just points to 189. So it's really the difference between 105, 189.1 and 228. So uh, I wanna thank Charles for this chart, this just trying to, to show um, some of the differences. You start at the retrospective short-term history and looking at a forward-looking more of a long-term. And um, so most of the work has been in that top row and annual. Uh, California has been ahead of um, it with Title 24 in their look at hourly data, uh, the 8760. And that is that is difficult it, when you start looking at the scale of something at, of um, um, you know, the U.S. California has got a, a is able to contain that for them, um, but 189.1, as Charles will talk about, is looking at marginal, hourly, and monthly. So these will be individual, one day per month, uh, 24 hour sequence of of uh, operational emissions. So um, one other thing I'll point out: all of these standards are only talking about operational emissions at this point. Uh, it's not talking about the uh, life cycle of either the equipment that's providing the um, the fuels, whether it's electricity or, or any of the other fuels, um, or the building itself. So there, that part of it, as we're going to lower energy in our operational emissions, should be considered in some way. Um, so if you look at these four standards, you'll see that source energy conversion is included pretty um, th pretty consistently throughout. Uh, it is primarily focused on, on the e-grid, the EPA part. There is some additions within 228 that deals with renewables, um, and some of the uh, time horizons are different, and which I already talked about. So 189.1, that 20 year uh, GWP, but uh, also looking at monthly and hourly marginals, which Charles will cover. Um, 228, this is where that first public review draft is. So don't, don't think that that may be where it heads up because there was a lot of concern about that. Uh, so from operational emissions, the 189s do include it as the 228. In 105, it's informative. There's just some uh, appendices which showing some example uh, regional values, but they're not consistent with the other two because they're based on some earlier information. None of them deal with embodied carbon or any of the supply. And um, the 189.3 and 228 also deal with the impact of refrigerant leakage, but 189.1 does not, uh, nor does 105. There's also some differences in how they treat um, renewables. 228, the emissions are set to zero, and, but they're accounted for at the value of the energy that's provided, um, uh, similar to the other, but the, specifically the emissions are, are, are dealt with there. So with that, thank you. And uh, I'll uh, defer questions uh, till the end. Thank you. Great, dear. Thank you so much. Lots going on over at Ashray. Now we'll uh, close the presentations with uh, hearing from Charles Ely, and then we'll move to some questions and answers after that. So Charles, I'll hand the screen share over to you. Unmute myself. Thanks, Gary. Um, let's see. Share. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about um, some efforts to apply uh, the LR MER long run marginal emission rights that. Uh, um, Michael Sontag and uh, 
Peter Gagna talked about at the, at the last meeting. Um, one of the uh, one of the first applications of um, slides are not advancing. Oh, there we go. Uh, one of the first applications of uh, of of this of this long long run marginal emission rate, which is zero code for California. Uh, this was first introduced in 2018 in advance of the Global Climate Action Summit chaired by uh, Michael Bloomberg and then Governor Jerry Brown. Um, so Architecture 2030, and I'm a senior fellow there, um, we, we took some of the work on, uh, we called it time dependent source energy. The Energy Commission now calls it hourly source energy. And, and we use this as the metric for compliance. Um, I think a lot of this was, uh, was based on some research that was funded by uh, Southern California Edison. So thanks, Randall, for that. Uh, there was also, <clears throat> we also updated the um, CBEC-COM, which is the compliance software. Uh, that's used for code compliance in California. Uh, that diagram to the left is sort of a 3D version of, uh, of a heat map with hours of the day along the front and, and months along the side. I'll be referring to that format uh, a little bit more in the presentation so you can uh, kind of get used to that. Um, so the, the California Zero Code is really quite simple. The first thing is you design an energy efficient building that complies with California's codes or better. Then you determine the renewable energy requirement, uh, either from prescriptive tables or energy simulations. You install as much on-site renewable energy as you can, uh, which will probably be inadequate for tall buildings or, and then, and then if necessary, you buy offsite renewable energy for, uh, for the remaining electricity that's involved. Uh, so anyway, again, this was released first in 2018. It's been updated to uh, align with the new standards that Randall referenced, which take effect at the end of 2022. Uh, and you can go to zerocode.org if you want more information. Uh, the, uh, the 2022 version of, um, of, the, of the zero code in California actually has two other things. It, 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 um, it prohibits on-site combustion uh, because the California grid is, is so clean that, that uh, and the climates are suitable for heat pumps. So it's, if you, if you want to re reduce carbon, the best way to, to do it is to avoid on-site combustion. And there's also a, an option for beyond code energy efficiency that local governments can adopt. Um, I mentioned uh, that, uh, that we updated the CBEC-COM compliance software. Um, and we added a, a, a photovoltaic model, a battery model. Uh, there's inputs in there for PV and storage systems. It does hourly carbon calculations and it produces uh, an XML output file that can be post-processed in, in various ways. So this was, this was part of our work at, that in, co in cooperation with the California Energy Commission. And there's also a, a calculator uh, located at zerocode.org that uh, where you can do, where you can do uh, quick estimates of, of energy use in your building. And, and you can look at four different metrics, site, source, uh, TDV, and carbon. Uh, if you want more information about this, um, you can visit zero-code.org and there's a whole bunch of documents there that you can download. 
Um, since um, since the 2018 version was adopted, there's been some um, derivatives. The first was uh, the California version that I mentioned. Uh, some of the some of the information in the zero code was incorporated in 189.1 uh, 2020. Uh, and some of it also made its way into the IECC uh, 2021. This is an optional appendix. Um, it, the new version of 189.1, uh, which we're we calling the 2023 version, we're introducing a, a new concept that we call the uh, zero carbon emissions factor or ZSEF. Uh, what it is, it's the it's the ratio of the carbon emissions in your rated building to the 90.1 PRM baseline. And we have, a, we have an equation where you can calculate uh, the target. Um, in, in California, there's an 8760 series, time series, and it's synchronized with the 16 weather files in California. But as Drew alluded, uh, that model is not transferable to the US. I borrowed these images from Joe Wong and uh, you can see all the sites in the US and internationally that, that have weather files. There's thousands of them. So, uh, so what we've done or what we're proposing to do in the 2023 version of 189 is to, is to develop uh, what we're calling these uh, month hour heat maps. And there would be a, a month hour heat map like this for each of the 26 E-grid subregions. I've shown three of them here, California, Texas, and the Midwest. The lighter colors represent periods when the emissions are low and the darker colors periods when emissions are high. Uh, we're working with NREL uh, to, to develop these values. And we're, we're, we're hoping that they will be a part of the 2023 20, uh, 189.1. This is the direction we're going. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, <clears throat> one of the things about um, uh, zero carbon accounting or zero carbon goals is that it's not possible to install enough PV on, for many buildings to, that, to achieve uh, zero carbon because of shading, building height, or other restrictions. So the, inter, the California, or excuse me, the zero code in California recognizes several ways to buy offsite procurement or offsite renewable energy. And uh, some of these, the ones I highlighted in bold, are, are also recognized in standard uh, 189. Um, what, when you start looking at hourly um, carbon emissions, it, um, it matters, um, let's go here, go back to this, this graph. This is, this is a 3D version of the heat map. And you can see in the, in the middle of the day, carbon emissions are quite low and then they come up in the afternoon. And this, this pattern you know, continues for all of the seasons. Now, if you look at the, the solar energy that was purchased by the California ISO in 2012, you can see that most of that, uh, most of that energy occurs during periods when carbon emissions are low. So if you're looking for, at, for the avoided emissions, what you need to do is you need to multiply the production uh, heat map times the emissions heat map. And for and I did this brief calculation, but for for solar, the avoided emissions are about 390 pounds for each megawatt hour that's produced. And this is a rough guideline for both uh, utility scale and um, uh, rooftop solar. Uh, if you look at wind, this is a similar diagram for wind. Uh, in California, uh, it tends to taper off in the middle of the day, which makes it a nice complement for solar. So when you multiply that times the carbon emissions rates 
for each hour. Uh, the avoided emissions are about 25% higher, uh, 486 pounds for each megawatt hour of wind, where solar was about 390 pounds per megawatt hour. So this is, this is um, kind of an interesting twist uh, for offsite purchases of renewable energy. Um, geothermal, uh, eligible hydro and biomass, these, these plants tend to operate like base load generators. So you don't see the, the diurnal pattern. Um, just to kind of wrap this up, uh, as we push towards zero carbon, I think we're gonna see a lot of pressure in, in building design. First of all, more energy efficiency, a flatter load curve. We're gonna see more renewable energy, uh, more batteries and storage. Uh, we'll store energy during low carbon periods and use it during high carbon periods. Uh, we'll, we'll run our thermal storage systems backwards. We will, in the daytime, we'll make ice when electricity is clean and we'll use that ice to carry us through those shoulder periods. And we're also gonna see a, a shift, I believe, towards, uh, towards more electric uh, facilities. So I'll stop there and uh, hopefully leave a, a few minutes for, for questions, uh, Carrie. So I'll turn it back to you now. I'll stop my sharing. Great, thanks, Charles. Well, uh, fascinating work. We have a few questions that have come in so far and folks feel free to use the, the Q&A feature to add more. Uh, so the first one came in, I think probably this is for Randall. This is from Jamie Backus. And uh, the question is, what can we anticipate from the new NEM uh, 3.0 from the California IOUs? I would love to hear more on PV and ESSS grid and PV tied to learn how to perform LCCA and GHG reduction analyses. But we'll need to know how energy arbitrage and net metering are handled by various rate tariffs. Um. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, unfortunately, I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball on where NEM is going. Um, I think that the forecast that, so, so what's baked into the E3 forecasts um, that Michael Sontag uh, talked about last time and what we, and what I presented today does, does to my knowledge, assume sort of the worst case on future NEM, meaning that it is at the, um, I forget what the term is, I guess it's wholesale generation rate, I think, which is probably the worst case um, because the, they're, while they may have the best crystal ball, I think it's best to assume the worst case. I don't know if anybody else, has any, Charles, do you have any <laughs> insights into uh, that? I, I don't have an opinion about that one. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Yeah. All right, this one is coming from Ted Tiffany. It's addressed to Drew, although you all might have a thought on it. Do you believe ASHRAE should take a stance on decarbonization and declare a mission to get off fossil fuels or maintain their fuel neutrality position? I think ASHRAE is going to try to stay neutral, but on the other hand, uh, there there's a, a task force on building decarbonization underway, and there are about 150 people involved in it at this point. There's also a decarbonization um, position document that is being developed right now that um, the uh, ASHRAE board will probably take up early next year. It, it uh, it's. It's too long at this point is the problem, but it's, uh, uh, I think there is going to be a, a real push toward um, trying to take the carbon out without trying to take a, a, a stance on uh, fossil fuels. Um, and then there's one that's been answered, but there were some follow-ups, so maybe we can cover it just in case folks missed it. This one came from Greg Collins. 
question is, how do you how do these various energy TDD emission factors account for upstream lossage and leakage of natural gas? We know that 100% distribution efficiency is a farce. And Randall, you took a first pass at answering that, but maybe you can give us a, a quick summary. Yeah, my understanding is that Title 24 doesn't include the upstream uh, gas leakage at this point. Um, it may be because it it depends on a number of things uh, or could depend on a number of things that we don't fully have enough answers to, but so I think more research is included. So for now, my understanding is that uh, gas leakage is only include behind, is included behind the meter. Do you, Charles, do you know more about that? Yeah, for, for 189, we, we are looking at the upstream emissions. Um, and for this reason, uh, the, the, um, the carbon emission rates for using a therm of gas are about 50% higher than, the, than, than just looking at the stack emissions. Um, and, uh, the, and methane leaks are the big issue there. And uh, there's, there's a couple of, uh, right, what we assumed in developing the uh, standard 189 emission rates is that 1.4% uh, of the gas that's delivered to power plants is lost along the way. And 1.8% of the gas delivered to buildings is lost along the way. So the, the, the higher building number would include stuff behind the meter, uh, Randall, as well as things in front of the meter. Um, the, and, and these, these upstream emission rates, uh, another thing we're assuming is, is a 20, 20 year time horizon for global warming potential instead of the, the more commonly used 100 year time horizon. So what this means is that the global warming potential for methane is 84 at 20 years and it's only 28 at 100 years. So those two things together uh, bring up uh, the upstream emissions quite a bit. The data we're using comes from uh, NREL's uh, LCI database. Uh, there was a paper first written by Paul Torsolini and Michael Deru that we that we that we re re reference, uh, and and we and we just recently got some more updates, some more updated information from the NREL LCI database. The, inf the data we're using on methane leaks comes from a, uh, a, a US nettle report that was published, I believe in 2016, um, where we're looking, I think nettle has updated that report and we're looking to update those numbers as we, as we develop uh, the emission rates for uh, 2023. But we do include upstream emissions, and that's one of the reasons that 189 emission rates are, are a lot higher than those published by EPA and most everybody else. Great, thank you. And then uh, in, the, in the answers, Ted also pointed to a resource for regional leakage rates, um, the gasindex.org. And Raul mentioned that right at the end of the metrics development that they did add methane leakage to the source metric and they're using a 20 year global warming potential calcs. Okay, um, from Amir, the question is amazing inf info. One question, how would one think about future emission trends from utilities with tangible projection of renewable penetration in the grid, which is hard to factor in current regulatory and policy landscape? I would think that that's right along the lines of what uh, 189 is already doing, working with uh, with NREL and their model, uh, Charles. Um, yeah, because it, it is a future, you know, I talked about retrospective and future, and this new approach is looking 20 years out, not so much what we could get from what was previously 
uh, calculated or estimated. Um, so that's the uh, the real challenge there. Well, that, that's that's one of the decisions we're going to have to make in 189 is uh, because it, what NREL has several scenarios uh, and the and the few and the long run marginal emission rates depend on which what scenario you choose. Uh, there's sort of a business as usual scenario, which is the one we've been kind of leaning toward, but it's very conservative. You know, it, uh, we're 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 considering using a um, a low a low renewables cost scenario, which would mean that over the next twenty or thirty years. Um, more more renewables would come online both on the rooftops and uh, at the utility scale. Yeah, uh, and I could say, you know, um, on behalf of utilities, we're expecting very high penetrations of, of DERs in the future. We're planning on grid investments to accommodate them. Um, so that's renewables, that's energy storage, um, that's the controls, which are very important. So um, we do see meeting the policy goals um, that the state of California has, um, uh, which, which is pretty aggressive. Um, so that's, that's where we see things going. Great. That uh, puts us right at the hour. So I wanna take a moment and thank all of our panelists today. Really great presentations on a quite gnarly topic. Um, for those in the audience, I wanted to flag that we do have some upcoming webinars. The one on uh, the 28th is large scale modeling of wind comfort and safety using congestion and comfort analysis. And then in November, we'll hear from ARINET using 3D convolutional neural networks to estimate annual radiation intensities on building facades, which is from the research committee. And uh, with that, I think we will close the, the, the presentation around the hour. Thanks for everyone to join and thank you so much to the presenters. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.